On the 27th of September 1825, 12 wagons full of coal were led from the Phoenix Pit here at Whitton Park to the bottom of Etherley Ridge and then hauled up 1,100 yards to the top of the embankment by a steam powered stationary engine at the top. The wagons were then led down Etherley South Bank towards West Auckland where they were joined by other wagons filled with sacks of flour. Then the whole thing was led by horses towards somewhere called Brusselton West Bank. Now this just seems like another typical horse-drawn wagon train which was used all over this part of the northeast at that time. This is coal country and hauling coal in wagons was a modern standard practice that had been perfected here. But what happened next to this particular train of wagons was a world first and by the end of the journey way over at Stockton on Tees the entire course of human history had been set on a completely different course. Well hello everybody and welcome to County Durham. I've come here today to answer a question which I've been fascinated about for years. What remains of the world's first railway to adopt steam powered locomotives? This is the Stockton and Darlington Railway. So as usual I'll be telling the story of this wonderfully historic railway by following it from one end to the other and seeing just what's left of its remains. Now contrary to the popular belief, the Stockton and Darlington Railway actually began somewhere called Witton near West Auckland, which in the 19th century was dominated by collieries. This old map dating back to between 1840 and 1860 shows the old Witton Park colliery where the coal was extracted and the journey began. By the time this map had been produced, the track has already been pulled up as better lines were laid nearby at other collieries but the line on the right hand side of the road is still marked out. Today this is all private property and not very open access and sadly there's little to no evidence left of the track bed. Now these houses were not here in 1825 but if we walk behind them we can actually follow the line of the track as specified by engineer George Stevenson. Along here and through this field heading defiantly in a straight line. Now it's thought that at this point here where this outline of a smaller building still exists that the wagons were unhitched from the horses weighed and payment was made to haul them along the line. The smaller building here might have actually been the pay office. So now I'm walking on the first actual hard evidence of the line, the original line. This embankment behind me made in 1822, which raises the wagons up 40 foot. And it was made from just old rubble from the nearby quarry. So this ordinary looking footpath is actually still the embankment and it's coming downhill now from the engine house at the top down to somewhere called Greenfields. And it's amazing to think that this quite ordinary looking footpath, which you wouldn't look twice at, is actually part of the world's oldest steam powered railway. It's amazing. Um, so next up we've got some more archaeological remains, a bit more physical remains coming up just down near the river. So the wagons then descended down to West Auckland where they came across the first major geographical obstacle they had to face, the River Gornless. And to cross that they built a bridge here which you can still see the stone foundations of. These two abutments either side of the river, isn't it just fantastic, look at them, beautiful. And because this bridge was made of iron, it had to be to be strong enough to support the wagons. This is technically, technically the world's first Iron Railway Bridge. So 
So still heading south uh, from the bridge, still following the River Gornless, and I've just seen a little culvert, a nice stone culvert where a little brook, a little stream was coming into the Gornless. Um, but I'm hoping if I go a bit further down, there might be evidence of a bigger tunnel. Uh, no, sadly, there isn't. Um, I've just got off the track bed, which is up there. I was hoping for a little footpath, a little um, pedestrian tunnel underneath, which is supposed to be around this area here, but it's all overgrown and probably filled in as well. But from here you can see just how raised up the track bed is all along as we go further south towards now Darlington. Oh, it's been a hell of a journey, hell of a walk. But after miles and miles and miles and miles, I don't know how many miles, I finally got to the highlight of the entire route, which is here, Brusselton, a bridge and an incline. Yes, yeah, so where I am now, it's actually quite overtly a former railway line. And it's really exciting to be stood here, actually. These stone sleepers down here, you can still see where the, the wood, the wooden sleepers were. They show the gradient going up towards Brusselton. In fact, if I turn the camera around, you might be able to see, once it adjusts to the light, the, the amount of incline we've come up from Auckland down there in the valley. It's quite steep. So yeah, it leads uphill to Brusselton because it had to, it had to navigate these rolling hills somehow. So it goes uphill to Brusselton, a town created by the Stockton and Darlington Railway Company specifically to house the workers on this line. And it was placed there because that's where the second engine house was, which was used to haul the wagons up the hill. Yeah, but look at this. This is amazing. This is like standing on some ancient Roman road, except it's probably more important than that because it's not just another line on a map of a network of roads. This is the first of the network. This line is the first of a network which would eventually spread out across most of the globe. We don't know where the first Roman road was, but we know where the first railway line was. And this is it. Now there are many reasons why the Stockton and Darlington line came into existence, but the most obvious one is quite simple. By the start of the 19th century, demand for coal was skyrocketing across Britain. County Durham had plenty and couldn't get rid of it fast enough. But there were other background influences going on as well. Back in the 1810s, settlements along the River Tees, such as Middlesbrough and Stockton, were tiny by comparison to today. The river was the key to unlocking their economic potential allowing raw materials from the hills and valleys nearby to make it to far-flung markets. Stockton itself had spent a great deal of money straightening and deepening the river through the town and wanted to recoup that investment by encouraging trade. After the idea of a canal went down like a lead balloon, engineer George Overton proposed a tram route from the collieries at Etherley all the way to Stockton. And despite a series of aristocrats opposing the line going near that land, in a way which pretty much echoes what happened with HS2 very recently, expensive deviations and compromises were reached, and the line was finally proved in 1821. But this was a tramway. Nobody had said anything about steam locomotives. The man behind the line and the biggest investor was Edward Pease, a woolen manufacturer from Darlington, who was passionate about the economy of the Tees, competing with the Tyne further north. Now he turned to George Stevenson, a self-educated engineer working at a colliery in Killingworth. At the time, the Northeast was a hotbed of people designing locomotives. Steam engines that could transport themselves along rails. And Stevenson was one of them. Upon taking the Stockton and Darlington job, Stevenson suggested the use of locomotives. For the first time, locomotives would no longer be confined to pulling goods around collieries and workyards. Now they could be unleashed to run across great distances. And the engine he and Pease came up with to do the job was named Locomotion 1, a powerful engine capable of pulling a long train of heavy wagons, or travelling freely at a maximum speed of 15 miles an hour. By September 1825, both the engine and the track were ready 
for opening day. Eventually, at about 8 o'clock, the wagons reached the village of Shildon, where, beside this pub formerly called the Mason's Arms, something truly historic happened. The name of the pub might not give much away, but two modern day street names certainly do. Railway Terrace and Station Street. So here in Shildon, the wagons containing coal and flour came down this way and stopped here where I'm stood now, where more wagons were attached. These wagons, however, contained 500 passengers, including one wagon, a proper passenger carriage, by the way, named Experiment, built especially for dignitaries and the wealthy to do. And at the head of it all was a steam engine called Locomotion One, one of the first steam engines ever built and specially chosen to make history right here. And of course, back then there was no such thing as a train station. The concept hadn't even been invented yet. Passengers alighted here at ground level after buying their tickets over there at the pub. In fact, it'd be another 17 years before this area got a proper passenger station. And you can just imagine, can't you, the, the noises which would have been going on here nearly 200 years ago. The excitement, the nervous laughter, plus the sounds from the engine itself, which would have been exciting, but also probably quite frightening. At about 10 a.m., the engine let off a great whoosh of steam, sending some onlookers running, fearing an explosion. Then the engineer and committee member, Timothy Hackworth, shouted, All ready! And with George Stevenson at the helm, Locomotion 1 and its train began moving. Now you know me, I usually get over excited and over enthusiastic about bits of history that I'm looking at in the moment, but I think this one actually deserves to be stretched out and looked at in more detail. Steam locomotives have been around a little while, thanks to Richard Trevithick and others like that who were pioneering the technology. Since the first steam locomotive had been invented, their use on early railways to haul goods had been sparse but promising. Nobody really knew if there was great demand for passenger railways. Raw materials and goods certainly needed to move long distances, but people rarely did. Early railway investors often thought the use of railways as human transport was a bit of a folly. But powered by the confidence, ambition and ego of men like Stevenson, Hackworth and Pease, the Stockton and Darlington line here at Shildon showed that such an idea was not only physically possible at scale, but could be just as commercially viable as hauling wagons of coal. In the entire history of the world, nothing had moved across the earth without the use of muscles, gravity, or the weather. Steam locomotives moved regardless of all of those things. It was the beginning of everything we see today, from cars to trains to planes. It was the beginning of mechanical transport. So far we've been tracking this faint track line along the map from the collieries to Shildon, but now it becomes a different game altogether. Here Shildon station is still part of a live rail line, which passes not far from Witten on its way northwards. Now obviously this was built later as the rail network was established. But the 1825 line had such a profound impact on the village that a new Shildon, aptly named New Shildon, soon sprang up, transforming the landscape here into an industrial one. Some old relics at Shildon have a sense of history, but from here onwards, the Stockton Darlington line is current and active. So next it's time we head south to Darlington and pick up the trail there. Right, so I've got to North Road train station in the middle of Darlington, which is this, this beautiful old building. This is actually now the museum, the official museum to the Stockton and Darlington line. And as you can see, it's been done up, it's been renovated. You can't get on there, it's closed completely, including this old uh, wagon shed, this old train shed over there, very beautiful building. It's all been done up. And that's because in two years time, in 2025, it'll be the 200th anniversary of the opening of the line. So they're doing it up. So we'll have to come back in two years and take a look, that'd be really exciting. What we can do now though, is go down here towards the platform of North Road Station, which is still open and which is still an active uh, train station on the line. So around midday, about five hours after those wagons had first left the Phoenix Pit, 
they pulled into here in the middle of Darlington. It taken two hours for the locomotive to pull the rest of the wagons uh, nine miles from Shildon. A pace of four and a half miles per hour, which seems incredibly slow to us, but in the context of the day, that would have been extremely exhilarating for people on board. Now, of course, what's interesting about this station, in fact, all the stations along this line, is that they didn't exist in 1825. They were just stopping points. There wasn't an actual station here. In fact, there was nothing here, anywhere along the line, until 1842, which is why, when we talk about the world's oldest train stations, the Liverpool to Manchester line can claim to have them, especially Liverpool Road in Manchester city centre, which has stayed exactly how it was built, in 1830. However, just over here on this empty bit of land was the world's first purpose-built railway station. A simple building completed in 1827, it was originally a goods station, which let goods be taken off the line up there and lowered down to ground level, down here. Later on, it was transformed to a passenger station and houses, but only in 1833. And, although sadly, it was demolished just over 30 years later. Now, as sad as it is that it hasn't survived, just a short distance away, we can see perhaps the crowning glory of the original Stockton and Darlington line. And the most impressive remains yet, the Skern Bridge. Now, this amazing Georgian-style stone bridge built in 1824 is where the line crossed and still crosses the river Skern. Now it doesn't look that remarkable but by virtue of being on the Stockton and Darlington line this is the world's oldest railway bridge still in use. 1824 that's 200 years of railway history still being used today. It's the Skern bridge that is depicted in a famous oil painting by artist John Dobbin that has now become iconic of the whole Stockton and Darlington line. So this part of Stockton is pretty much the end of the line, marked by these wonderful buildings over there across the road. Over there on the left hand side is the old tavern building, yes, the world's first railway tavern. And that is where people would have bought their tickets, as in the tradition of the old stagecoach. That building on the far right hand side was the old Waite House, designed to look like a toll booth with distinctive angled windows so that people inside could see up and down the line. The line of course coming from where those trees are, up this way and across the road right here. Now surprisingly there are a lot of unanswered questions still about that day. For example, did that inaugural train stop here or further down by the riverside where the coal and the flour was going anyway? Secondly, where did people buy their tickets around here? Was it in this building or just the tavern or other pubs and taverns in the area? And thirdly, why has this building kind of been forgotten about? What is it about not being able to make money from something which means we just don't care about it anymore? Now on this part of the riverside in 1825 was a very small shipbuilding yard, a small coal yard and a small row of cottages. The rest was green countryside and here by the water's edge would have been quite idyllic. Unlike the early days of the line which was beset with problems straight away. For a start the locomotives kept running into big issues. Locomotion 1 broke a wheel a couple of weeks after opening day and it took a while to set up the second engine called Hope. It actually took a few years to really sort out steam engines on the line, but that didn't make a difference to the passenger service anyway, since the locomotives were never really used to pull people, just goods. Passengers hoping to travel the line were pulled by horses in carriages, such as experiments, and this one depicted here called Union. Still, according to one source, between 30 and 40,000 passengers enjoyed travel along the line in the year between July 1826 and June 1827. 
In the years following its opening, the line saw several additional branch lines and changes in destination, eventually diverting to Middlesbrough further along the Tees. And it didn't take long for much of the infrastructure of the original line to become superseded. Into the 1830s, railways began popping up across England quickly as the benefits became clear and new lines joined the first one across the northeast. So there you go, a common journey from pit to sea, but this time a journey like no other. Now a couple of years ago I did a couple of videos on the Liverpool to Manchester Railway and I called it the first proper railway anywhere in the world and I explicitly used the word proper because it was the first time steam locomotives have been used from one end to the other completely, the first time timetabled services have been introduced and much of the rail infrastructure we enjoy today. But between the ancient wagonways pulled by horses and the complete mechanisation of the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, you have this middle step, which is the Stockton and Darlington Railway. It was a huge leap forward, a bold embracing of a brand new technology. And it's only right then that we acknowledge it as the world's first proper passenger railway service.